But on behalf of the Pediatric um, College Group of Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome everyone to today's CAP session protocol um, education session on Ewing sarcoma. Before we start speaker, um, we would and underway, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, the session is being recorded and a link to the recording will be circulated to all participants via email when it becomes available. Both the live presentation and the recording presentation are eligible for CME credits. Information for obtaining credits can be found on the session in the session notice. Please note that the CME certificates for each of the education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. Refer to the session notice for the exact deadline date. Please that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. Uh, we have a large number of participants and will not be able to troubleshoot WebEx issues as part of this call. If you're experiencing technical difficulties, please call WebEx support line. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature within WebEx. Chat instructions can also be found in the session notice and answer a portion of the presentation, a session moderator will post the submitted questions on your behalf, for as long as time permits and in the order in which they appear. In the window, please include the following information. Your institution name, name of the individual posing the question, and your question. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dina L. de Malawi. Dina Malawi is a pediatric pathologist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, an associate professor at the University of Ottawa, and is appointed at the CHEO Research Institute as a clinical investigator. She completed her anatomical pathology residency training at the University of Toronto and a pediatric pathology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Malawi, primary areas of interest are uh, perinatal pediatric soft tissue and bone pathology. She is a guest speaker in national meetings, including the second annual conference in forensic and pediatric pathology and the annual Tom Small Canadian Orthopedic Association based science course. She contributed to the World Health Organization classification of tumors, WHO Blue Book, pathology and genetics tumors of the lung, pleura, thymus, and heart cardiac homas. 2004, and the Diagnostic Pediatric Cytopathology and uh, Histopathologic Corn published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. She has several positions, including Director of Histochemistry at William Osler Health Centre in Toronto and Director of the Histology Laboratory at Health Sciences North in Sudbury. She is a member of the International Society of Pediatric Pathologies Archives Committee and Pathology and Laboratory Medicine Committee, and Wellness Advisory and Faculty Experience Team Committee in Ottawa. Without further ado, I introduce Dr. L. de Malawi to give today's talk on Ewing sarcoma. Julia, for the nice introduction. I have no financial relationships to disclose. I will not be discussing any label use or investigational use in my educational presentation. Uh, uh, protocol uh, we're covering today is, is uh, the protocol for examination of specimens from pediatric patients with Ewing sarcoma. The protocol was posted on the website, on the CAP website, in August 2016. Uh, authors of the protocol are Dr. Bahrami, Dr. Hicks, Dr. Powell, and Dr. Zernitsky. This current protocol we're discussing, as well as the previous version, which was posted in 2012, based on the AGCC UICC 11th edition. The aim of the current talk is to review um, CAP protocol related to Ewing sarcoma in order to be an integral part in reporting these tumors by pediatric pathologists and highlight uh, the latest revisions that came on the new protocol compared to the one that was posted in 2012. 
included under the current protocol include the Ewing sarcoma family of tumors, which include Ewing sarcoma and peripheral primitive neuroectotumors, the PT. The same protocol covers those that arise from bone site as well as those as outside of bone. Side of bone include but not limited to soft tissues, uh, chest wall tumors, previously known as Askin tumors. Um, some Ewing uh, reports show that it can arise in parenchymal organs like the kidney and the skin, though very rare. Extra uh, paraspinal tumors are included. However, CNS tumors are excluded as they are recognized to be a different set of tumors and a totally different protocol should be applied on reporting them. I'm thankful to the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and uh, the Canadian Association of Pathologists uh, for hosting the current session. Uh, so we'll be focusing on uh, reporting of Ewing sarcoma children. However, the same protocol is applicable for adults, for Ewing sarcoma arising in adults. When we open on the care protocol, we'll find that uh, the first one is for biopsy and then another one for resection. Most findings to be reported are between biopsy and resection. Resection do have additional findings to be reported. So for sake of time, I amalgamated both, and I'll highlight those additional findings to be reported on resection. Let's proceed further. A moment of remembrance to Dr. James Ewing, who was a pathologist in Cornell and was the first to recognize Ewing sarcoma. He uh, recognized it way long before the uh, immunohistochemistry era, um, first described it as endothelioma. However, with the immunohistochemistry and molecular findings and the current research, it's documented it has nothing to do with endothelial origin. Cell of origin is still a debate. Most favored is uh, primitive mesenchymal stem cell as a cell of origin. Uh, remarks on spasm and handling before we enter in the core of the synoptic report. So the first thing, we need fresh tissue. Not only fresh tissue, but fresh viable tissue. And the minimum amount we need for um, fresh viable tissue is 100 milligram to be submitted for cytogenetics or and uh, freezing. And the image uh, shows what amount of 100 milligram. The other way to think about this amount is uh, a cubic centimeter. So that's the minimum amount we, we need. Uh, Ewing sarcoma cases are extensively necrotic, and this uh, puts the pathologist in a situation that we are dealing with limited tissue. One thing to remember that priority is always given for formalin. We cannot make a diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma without the morphology. The molecular findings in Ewing sarcoma are very characteristic, but the cannot interpre be interpreted without the uh, micropic findings of the tumor, without the morphology. And priority is al always given to formalin. Because some of the tumor can be extensively necrotic. Sometimes the surgeons ask for a frozen section. On cases with the tissue, we can keep the frozen aliquid um, in state. We freeze it in minus 70 degrees and it can act for, uh, as our SNF freeze. Trans can be assessed using uh, RT-PCR or FISH. Both can be done on frozen tissue or formalin-6 paraffin embedded. For RT-PCR, frozen tissue is much preferred compared to uh, formalin-6 paraffin embedded, though both can work, but the yield is better with fro frozen tissue. For the need for SNF frozen tissue it is not only for diagnostic purposes. Um, in some cases, um, or patients with uh, Ewing sarcoma, to enter certain studies and to have certain treatment protocol according to their stratification, sometimes additional tests are needed, and for this, the oncologist may require uh, SNF frozen tissue to conduct these tests on. So always recommended to have some uh, frozen tissue. The other point for dealing uh, spasmin is on resection. Like in resection, 
margin, we need to paint the margin before putting a knife. That's the important thing so we don't compromise assessment of our margin. The other thing in resection, um, that it's not specific because with other bone tumor, particularly osteosarcoma, is important, is the full specimen mapping. We have to assess the preoperative chemotherapy, the induction chemotherapy effect on the tumor. In order to do that, the pathologists have to, full, uh, to do full specimen mapping. And I'll explain this in coming slides. So this is an example of an Ewing sarcoma um, section. So the first thing recommended, if possible, is to review the uh, imaging findings. And the reason uh, for that, it will highlight our anatomical landmark, what's on imaging uh, the tumor extension is. I try to orient the specimen, and if at any point something is not clear, we can always ask the help of the orthopedic surgeon or his fellow to orient the specimen for us. And we take our images for documentation of different views. Then we start to paint the specimen, paying careful attention to soft tissue margins. This one that have been inked, well, soft tissue margins inked very nice, as well as bone margin, and then bisected. Then we document by images the aft specimen. Sometimes we struggle with the specimen uh, because of the soft tissue component that have different consistency compared to bone. Cutting through it is sometimes uh, difficult. The soft tissue, especially with the hand or the band, so tend to shatter. On those cases, some people apply a technique that they uh, freeze uh, the region, uh, particularly those with amputation or with a lot of soft tissue component. Uh, they freeze the specimen for 24 to 48 hours. This makes the soft tissue component have the same consistency similar to bone, and thus cutting through it make it easy and um, make soft tissue uh, part scattered and easily cut and able us to have a nice bone slabs we want to have that should be of a thickness of ideally 0.5 centimeter, but um, many could be one centimeter or 1.2, depends on, on, on how um, good and how uh, we can cut in this specimen. This is image slabs um, that have been inked uh, well, and the sections are embedded, and each section we took have been mapped on the digital image. So to elaborate on that, so the minimum requirement for uh, if sarcoma is to have a full frontal um, uh, section embedded entirely and examined microscopically. Prefer preferably, this full section should be the tumor largest uh, diameter. In order to do that, We'll get our bone slab, we'll take pictures, and on the edge, we'll apply a grid diagram of the histological sections taken. If we camera, or what people used to do before, they used to graph the spasm after placing it in a plastic bag, and like this, they will have a black and white image, and then they apply the grid diagram. So on the right hand side, we see a bone uh, reaction for Ewing sarcoma. On the left, the soft tissue. And this is how it is embedded, and this is how each cassette, um, each section put in a cassette is labeled on the image. Uh, so when we look at our microscopic examination to assess for the uh, chemotherapy response, we can correlate to the corresponding uh, section taken on the image. And this will enable us to assess how much necrosis the tumor has relative to the whole tumor size. A thing that's recommended for the tumor is not only to have a, a full sagittal section, this is the minimum, but as well we have to go in depth uh, every one centimeter perpendicular on the tumor and take off section so, can, so we can assess the extent of the tumor, how did it act to the chemotherapy. So now entering in the care protocol. So as I mentioned, it will be like biopsy and resection. For sake of the current presentation, we amalgamate 
related both. So for biopsy, it can be a core biopsy, it can be incisional biopsy, excisional biopsy. For resection, it can be amputation, limb salvage, or simply resection. This is a program that's helpful by open to understand the resection. So on the right hand uh, side of the screen, we have one applicable to bone. On the left side, we have one applicable to soft tissue. So the black circle, the black solid circle, is the tumor. And that have um, targeting only this area without surrounding margin is, is actually a biopsy, is central lesional uh, so it's a biopsy. Any tumor surrounded by a reactive zone, which is marked in this diagram by this blue uh, color, the red zone grossly looks negative, but microscopically can harbor morphosi. And thus, it's not enough just shelf the tumor with its reactive zone to establish regional control. One four is to go beyond with a of normal tissue surrounding to establish a wide resection. If the location necessitates to have the wide resection that the surgeon cut in an articular site joint, this defines radical resection. Left hand side we'll see for the soft tissue tumors, sedia, for example, uh, the ram is showing an Ewing sarcoma occurring in the muscle. So what will identify radical resection if we take a full muscle compartment resected in order to establish this wide or adequate margin. The second that we need to comment in the CAP protocol is the tumor site. We comment it because documentation, but as well because it's a prognostic indicator. From the other uh, prognosis indicators are the same, distal extremities tend to do fatal compared to proximal extremities and pelvic lesions tend to do worse. The next item we need to comment on is tumor size. And far in the care protocol, we only comment on the greatest dimension. When we use plus uh, simple here, it means it's optional for the pathologist to comment on binding or not. Dimension means like it's not an integral part to comment on, so it's not mandated for our for the oncologist to have this um, finding in order to establish their treatment protocol. But it does mean it's entirely not important. It means that still uh, studies are going and how much is useful is not yet settled. So it's encouraged to report. In Ewing sarcoma, the cutoff of greater dimension that will affect patient's outcome is 8 centimeters. So if tumor is 8 centimeters or below, provided that other risk factors, other prognostic indicators are the same, those patients will have a more favorable prognosis compared to those who are than 8 centimeters. And according to the AGCC grade uh, staging, centimeter is a cutoff to raise the patient from PT1 stage, from primary tumor stage of 1, to PT2. For uh, North American studies, they use the 8 centimeter and below uh, in their stratification compared to those more than 8 centimeter. Of the European studies, they use a tumor volume of 200 milliliter. So this could be helpful to report the additional dimension, as without the additional dimensions, we can't really estimate the tumor volume and allow us to do these comparative studies. Of course, we cannot comment on the tumor side because we only have part of it. The extent of tumor. And we can see, again, this plus sign, which indicates that this is an optional to report and it's in a soft tissue or a bone, it's really following the um, anatomical landmarks that are involved with tumor in this site. So when dealing with the bone, is which part of the bone? Is it the diaphysis? Is it the metaphysis? The tumor extends soft tissue or to the, the bone marrow. Most ink sarcomas affects the diaphysis, 
but then during presentation they will present with a metadiaphyseal lesion and they tend to show a soft tissue extension. Extra osseous tumors uh, similarly we're looking for anatomical landmark but different than the bone uh, than the bone will use uh, like tissue plans. So is it involving muscle? Did it extend to the fascia? Did it pre fascia and go to subcutis? Did it go to the skin? So these are things to document. One of the changes uh, in the current protocol in 2016, they added the chest tool. This uh, present in the 2012 version. And it's kind of nice to add it, particularly when dealing with the Askin tumor. It's difficult, particularly grossing the spasm and identify landmark, and particularly if we want to comment on the extent, particularly for osseous tumors. And I find like the MRI uh, correlation is very helpful. Um, highlight really what to look for and pay more attention to. So this is, for example, an Ewing sarcoma, and as we see with the red arrow, the posterior cortex of the bone is gone. So there is some suggestion of a soft tissue extension. So this will be paid attention to sample um, for this. The important thing to report on is margins. As regards biopsies, the only one that margins can be applicable to is for excisional biopsies. For the rest, it cannot be um, assessed. For us, we have two things to uh, pay attention to, whether the margin is involved or not. Not, but well, which margin is involved? So, is it a bone margin? Is it a soft tissue margin? Or is it other? And other can imply parenchymal margin. For in the 2012, there wasn't this other parenchymal margin. It's kind of added in the 2016, and it's very helpful. It's important for those of Askin tumor. For example, we can have a chest wall tumor that involves the pleura and lung, and we need to document the distance it from the resection margin. So for those occurring in the kidney uh, as a primary Ewing, rare cases, but can occur, then we need to comment on the parenchymal margin. In 2016, they, there was this addition that's kind of handy that they put if applicable. Uh, not all of tissue tumors will need a bone margin half, but usually not. So, so we don't only need to say margin is involved or not, but we have to measure the distance from the tumor to the closest specified margin. And this again, just a diagram to remind. So, yeah, as we see with um, number one uh, dotted line, anything going through the tumor, this is a positive margin. Number two, if something going on the reactive zone that will look to the surgeon as grossly negative, will be a marginal margin, which studies have shown that they are usually in adequate margins and do not guarantee um, uh, local tumor control. Four is a wide margin. We need this cuff of normal tissue surrounding the tumor. So the um, children oncology group study for Ewing sarcoma and PNT have shown that a minimum of a bone margin of 2 to 5 centimeter, they put it as range, is needed in order to achieve this wide adequate margins. Fascia, periosteum, intramuscular septum, septum need a 2 millimeter margin. At muscle and medullary bone, bone marrow, we need a 5 millimeter margin involved tissue and the distance between it and the tumor. For those patients who have a poor chemotherapy response, they need actually a wider margin. For those who doesn't achieve this recommended numbers or distance of margin from the tumor that were given by the Cox study, they might need a post-operative radiotherapy. So pathologists, we have to give these values. It's integrated in the patient's treatment. One of the debate question, what do we do on resection when we have an entirely necrotic tumor, but at the margin, distorted as positive or negative? This is still ongoing 
to be studied, like people are studying this and there isn't a firm answer. What's recommended to do is we call it a positive margin, but the comment we say it's entirely necrotic. We don't call it, we call it positive, but entirely necrotic. The next item to record is optional, is the vascular invasion, whether we have lymphatic or capillaries or endothelial lined vessels that are invaded with the tumor. According to the AGCC staging, this, we have a positive lymphovascular invasion. It doesn't upgrade or change the primary stage. It's to record, so non datary but recommended. Vascular invasion, as most tumors with Ewing sarcoma, there's no difference whether it affects lymphatic vessels or other endothelial lined non-lymphatic vessels, so there is no need to um, you need to afford to try to really see whether it's lymphatic or not. In many cases, we can we can see lymphovascular invasion without application of immunohistochem 3, but if we are not certain, we certainly can use the immunohistochem 3 to document. So for um, um, the uh, having sarcoma is managed because there are the coming items are some of them are related to management of Ewing sarcoma. And just, uh, the pathologist is the guy with the glasses. So um, um, Ewing sarcoma in three conditions: one during biopsy, one during resection, and one during staging, particularly with the bone marrow biopsy. So during biopsy, usually there is no diagnosis. Patient didn't have a treatment before. So it's mainly for diagnosis, the most common scenario. This section, they have received chemo or chemo and radiotherapy. Because once the pathologist makes the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma, the oncologist will give induction chemotherapy for certain weeks, depend on the protocol, and depend on the site of um, more for site of the tumor, um, so will be done aiming at total resection with wide margin of tumor. Um, patient can be given in certain circumstances, circumstances, particularly when there is pelvic uh, involvement, uh, when, when the pelvic bones are involved. And the pathologist will face the tumor with the resection. And the question there, one of the questions will be the margins, and the other one will be how the tumor reacted to the induction chemotherapy. So by each of that, the oncologist can adjust their maintenance chemotherapy. So for protocol, biopsy or resection, there will be on biopsy, pre-biopsy treatment. So we have to say if the patient was given any treatment before the biopsy or resection treatment in cases of resection. And and specify whether the therapy is given is a chemotherapy or radiation, or they didn't specify, or there wasn't, we'll put the option we have. This is mandatory to report. Will be how much of the tumor died, how much necrosis, tumor necrosis present relative to the whole tumor. That is why we went through the elaboration of um, having a full face of tumor at least to be mapped, um, we can correlate uh, the we can correlate it, uh, microscopically to our visual growth image. There are different ways and different um, um, grain system for uh, tumor uh, for the chemotherapy response. So there is uh, the HUVOS, H-U-V-O-S, uh, system, and there is uh, the Childhood Cancer Group, Pediatric Oncology Group, grading system, which is used by COG, and there are others. So one I'm quoting is the one that's used by COG. It's five grades, and the response in percent means how much necrosis that had the tumor with the pre-induction chemotherapy. And Necrosis correlates with how did the tumor respond? Did it show a complete response, so it's all died or just partial or, or none? Um, 
when we look at it, I put like the first two grades together because they really show no difference in survival. It's very poor and do and, and, and there is no difference in survival. So, so the best that the grades that are favorable are grade three and four, which according to the WHO is 90, more than 90% tumor response or complete response is a favorable radio, um, is a favorable chemotherapy response, while anything below is unfavorable. One thing remember that the BITOFTAS grading system and between the pediatric oncology group system, the, the group we have different grades, but that percent of tumor necrosis is different. So as a pathologist, we don't have to put the grading system. All we have to put and ensure that's accurate is the percent of necrosis. This is the grading system used by the COG, but it shows the uh, three-year survival rate. And we can see that once we approach more than 90%, the three-year survival reached to 73%. And of course, with complete, um, completely necrotic tumor, it will be 100%. It means that the tumor really um, all melted and all gone with the chemotherapy. One just to remember that trauma with our metastasis at time diagnosis, you see the five year survival is around seventy five percent. Around. Seventy three percent is acceptable uh, what's here to call it as favorable chemotherapy. With metastasis this figure drops tremendously. This is another system that's called the system of Peachy. It's used in Europe, um not here in North America. The only reason I'm quoting this system uh, for here just if, uh, if one of us like uh, just came through it, uh, just briefly it assesses instead of the other system we have shown it assesses how much we have viable tumor, not necrotic tumor, and it looks easy in terms of grade one by gross, grade two by microscopic, grade three uh, no viable tumor. However, it's more complicated than that. We have this grading system have a cutoff for microscopic is that the whole microscopic size of viable tumor should be less than the diameter of 10x, um, of 10x microscopic uh, power field. So we have to add them up and accordingly something on see in gross but exceeded the size of a diameter of the 10x microscope field will be actually grade one. The problem too is that microscopic fields are different. So it's what what could be microscopic could be macroscopic in another. And the fact that that is not very popular in um uh, to be in North America. So this is um, an Ewing sarcoma gross image. And what we can see we can see the tumor here. You should describe the, the Ewing sarcoma will have like a, a tan color or gray white. It will have the fish uh, flesh consistency, so rather a bit firm. Where the chemotherapy, they look like pus. They are yellow, friable, and liquefied. So these are necrotic foci. So two extremes image. So the one, the bigger one, is the one that showed the tumor that's completely died by chemotherapy, complete response, tumor necrosis 100%. The switch of a tumor that did not show any response to chemotherapy. What we will have, we'll have something like what's shown in this figure, where we have still um, or cluster of viable tumors. Most of the tumor gone, but there are uh, some viable tumor there. In most cases, compared, for example, to tumor like a neuroblastoma, there isn't really a differentiation that happened with chemotherapy. However, in some cases, particularly those of PNT, there can be a bit of differentiation with the tumor becoming a bit with more cytoplasm. Uh, not, and usually we don't need immunohistochemistry to document. The image of an 
a necrotic tumor over here. We can see the ghost cell as antihemocidrin. Most times, where the necrotic foci that we see in growth, for example, here we have these yellow pus areas, and they correlate to a necrotic tumor. Here, the necrotic tumor is replaced by fibrous tissue and some vessels resembling granulation tissue. The areas that look like fish, like fish uh, flesh over here, these gray, relatively firm areas have a viable tumor. Question raises, like, like um, we've mentioned that Ewing sarcoma tend to be a necrotic tumor. How can we say whether this tumor, whether this necrosis we're seeing is really because of the chemotherapy or it was originally in the tumor? Well, that's difficult and not set in the literature. There are a few things that we can use that one of them, if I have a biopsy, I'll pair it and I'll see how much necrosis uh, it had. For example, if my biopsy don't have any necrosis and I have a tumor that have 99% of a tumor necrosis, I probably will take that as tumor necrosis due to chemotherapy. Realize totally that the biopsy is part of the tumor, not all of it. Um, other thing uh, that some people will use, they use the imaging a bit because um, we have an MRI um, when the tumor uh, uh, before the biopsy, and then there will be a follow up imaging after the chemotherapy, and the one before uh, even the biopsy, um, and I speak about a necrotic tumor or not. Can, so something soft to correlate. Um, the point there isn't answer of black and white, uh, and this it's a difficult scenario that um, that is one of the difficult areas on assessing the chemotherapy response. The next would be the studies, and when we look at the ancillary studies, we can see that we have this. Plus, simple, that means that the pathologists have the option to report it or not. Having said that, testing for molecular uh, or molecular testing when dealing with sarcoma is um, one integral part and, um, and care for uh, the workout of uh, Ewing sarcoma. So, whenever we have Ewing sarcoma, special diagnosis, we need to test our, uh, the characteristic rearrangement. We can see that um, the next that is say is not performed. So performed, I mean, it will be for performed on the initial diagnosis, but I can think of a scenario, for example, uh, we have a biopsy of Ewing sarcoma, we tested for EWSR1 rearrangement that was positive, now, at the resection, do we have to resend for testing or not? I think in cases it could be appropriate to say not performed, provided that I compare the biopsy, and if I have a residual tumor, they look similar, and the clinical and everything fits with it, there is no need to repeat the testing. Other scenario, what do you do when you have a resection uh, for Ewing sarcoma and the tumor is entirely necrotic? You don't should test for. The next item is pending, which is actually nice to have because, for example, when we have Ewing sarcoma that's arising in non osseous site, we don't have the time to wait for decal and for filling of the specimen. And the cytic report and grossing and the slides could be already within two or three days. And for molecular studies, might take like another five days or another week or more. In these cases, if everything clinical, myopic, immunohamstry, and other morphological overlapping tumors are excluded, then we can say a sign with something like features consistent with the owing uh, sarcoma or small round cell tumor consistent with Ewing soma pending EWSR1 rearrangement. So we don't have, we can actually put our synoptic report and use the pending. Uh, then the synoptic report uh, go more elaborative to say which testing we have done. Do we identify the EWSR1 uh, rearrangement? The fusion partner is known or not? Which one of the fusion partner? What method we used? 
whether it's carry typing, whether it's fish, whether it's RT-PCR. Paired to the 2012 protocol, this become more elaborative. The 2012 was simply um, conventional carry typing performed or not, and then uh, other testing performed or not. So it was just simple and not so much in, in, in the details. And add an additional thing in the comment, we can say, uh, well, we did fish, but on Python embedded or on fresh tissue, uh, we can add uh, whether we used for our molecular testing fresh or uh, for fixed paraffin embedded tissue in a comp section. With e sarcoma, the this characteristic um, um, translation and fusion genes that lead to a chimeric gene that, that's crucial and essential for uh, the tumor pathogenesis. Most widely and faster and easier molecular testing is really to use the EWSR1 uh, PRECA part probe. I see an image on the right hand side where the blue and green uh, dots show the splitting of um, the USR1. But what we find when we have a positive uh, break apart fit for EWSR1, it has to be interpreted in the proper clinical and pathological context. And the reason for that is because there are other tumors that can, that can harbor the EWSR1 translocations, but they are not Ewing, like the dysmoplastic small round cell tumor, clear cell sarcoma, extra little myxoid chondrosarcoma, myxoid liposarcoma, and angiomatoid fibrocytoma. Luckily, most of these tumors really occur in the soft tissue. There are examples reported in bone, but they will overlap with extra osseous wing. But the nice thing is that they look different, with the exception of a dysmoplastic small cell tumor, both are round cell tumor, and but the immunohistochemical profile of them is different. So. Um, for e comma, there is a number of uh, translocations and few proteins have been identified. The cost that okay, about 85% of tumor is the EWS fly one fusion protein. Of the EWS fly one, there are a number of fusion proteins which in uh, more than 95% involve the EWS. There is a few protein that involves the FUS instead of the EWS. When tumor, what do we do when we have a tumor that doesn't have tested for EWS rearrangement is negative, and then for fish testing with for FUS is negative? Very uncommon scenario, um, but, but I think. Uh, what I'll do. So when we have a tumor with conventional features of Ewing, looks like this round cell tumor, um, that doesn't look particularly active. So Ewing sarcoma is an aggressive sarcoma, but the mitosis usually doesn't reflect that. You can go fields and fields without mitosis. There is no prisk mitosis in most of the cases. You don't have a nuclei uh, in them. And the size of the cells is really just um, less than two lymphocytes. Uh, and another thing you can use is the blood vessel endothelium is less than the size of two endothelial cells. And the important feature is the monotony of the tumor. So cells are twins. There is no surface. They all look identical. If anything, it's just the plane of sectioning of the cell. And some of them depends if they are PNT, we can have the rosette. And they stain diffusely and membranous, uh, usually positive uh, membranous staining for CD99. And why um, warning is helpful? The literature says like 75% to 90% of Ewing sarcoma will stain for it, so additional helpful one. So we have that. And then by other immunohistochemical, uh, we rule differentials. And important, we don't have a map. Matrix deposition. We don't have a steroid or car. We don't have any matrix. And by other immunohistochemistry, we ruled out ALL, neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma. 
We don't have any matrix for small cell osteosarcoma and it's in chimal chondrosarcoma. The, the osteosarcoma and chondrosarcoma tend to be FI1 negative, so it's another soft thing. And we would stand uh, for their molecular studies, but it's not possible to render a diagnosis of sarcoma slash PNT in absence of tumor finding translocation and the detection of, e of Ewing sarcoma PNT associated translocations is not mandatory to make the diagnosis. In which cases when other diagnostic enters have been excluded, a sign out of undifferentiated a diagnosis of undifferentiated round cell sarcoma with features of Ewing sarcoma could be appropriate. Having said that, we just got like um, several months ago a case um, that's really challenging and part of that, that it was negative for the FAS, for the EWS, but the other problem is the site. It was an African tumor, it's chest tumor. And with those, you might entertain a pluripulmonary blastoma on there. So, but talking about the regular ones with the regular morphology, with the regular immunohistochemistry and um, the common sites. It is not perfect, so not all have the conventional morphology. Some of them will have atypical features like a dementinoma like sclerosing pattern that can overlap with ischoid, uh, spinning very rare but have been reported, or those with atypical earring that are usually larger, have a nuclei, more mitotically active, and can show some pleomorphism. Uh, rhabdoid like features and octillioid features have been reported. With this, we need the molecular testing 100%. And I see these rare patterns emphasize on the importance of molecular testing for Ewing sarcoma associated translocations. So when we look at molecular events associated with Ewing sarcoma, we put the locations and the fusion genes, but in the recent decade they're starting to emerge these entities of e like sarcomas. And enough, most of them have an EWSR1, most but not all. If we test for the EWSR1 rearrangement, they will be called. However, those sarcomas, it's yet known whether they represent a sarcoma and all have to be done to expand this translocations, uh, liquor event to include them, or they are different and they have uh, um, uh, different noses and different features to them. So far, they look like Ewing, and that's why they are Ewing like sarcoma, and so are the oncologists treat them as, uh, with the Ewing sarcoma protocol. Some of the Ewing like sarcoma uh, worth to pay attention to, and then for it, there's emerging literature on, and hopefully, uh, in the few years, we might it might be more. Um, identifiable their features and see really where they will sit. So the first one is P core C N N B three comma. It's that clinically and morphologically with Ewing sarcoma. So have a predilection to teen age males. It affects bone and soft tissue like Ewing. It's a small round cell tumor, however morphologically tend to be more angulated compared to conventional Ewing sarcoma. Some not women can show a spindle cell morphology. It's the Ewing that they show variable expression to CD99. So they don't have the diffuse nice staining for CD99, but by definition, they have the cyclin B3 uh, positive nuclear staining. With regard to their behavior, they behave uh, and their prognosis seems to be similar to Ewing sarcoma. This is one of the um, sarcomas, we try to identify when we have our EWS R1 rearrangement and the FAS are negative. Um, so I can sign away, I mentioned, and then send um, for uh, testing for cyclin B3. The other one is the cis dux 4 sarcoma. It's a bit different morphologically and in the clinical presentation from Ewing sarcoma and even in behavior. So it's a deliction to young adults. So it's not something we'll see in children, although rare cases have been described in adolescents. Um, it occurs only in the soft tissue, 
doesn't affect the bone. It's not like ewing where 80% it will occur in the bone and 20%, around 20% will occur in the soft tissue. This is a soft tissue tumor. I think morphologically, it shows extensive necrosis. They are uh, small, round, and blue, but tend to show more pleomorphism and prominent nuclei and coarser uh, chromatin. They can mixoid and and this uh, tricks and dysmoplasia and crystal areas. So, more frequently, they will be with the group of um, of atypical Ewing. Expression to the CD to CD99. They don't stain usually. They don't stain diffusely and strongly with this marker, like with Ewing sarcoma. And they tend to show a higher, high, highly aggressive behavior compared to classic Ewing. The next will comment on the CAP protocol, and this is uh, different than the one in 2012, where at this point, be uh, uh, comments using the AGCC staging system. But in the 2016, that's how it is, and it's handy and easier for the pathologists. This is, of course, applicable um, more for resection rather than a biopsy. So a lymph node, whether we have node or not, what's their number and how many of them were involved with tumor. And we always have um, this um, number to say, um, if we cannot uh, see we have to say why. And the distant metastasis, and for distant metastasis, it's only we say it's there when we confirm it pathologically. So we don't go with the imaging and see, um, for example, we have this small lung nodule, suspicious for metastasis or could lead granuloma. We really need to look at sections and document it pathologically. And one of the th these things that pathologists get involved to document the metastasis is the bone marrow biopsy, marrow with metastatic Ewing. So just a few words on metastasis. So compared to Ewing sarcoma that's localized and that show uh, metastasis on imaging or biology, uh, overall survival and the five year survival uh, drop tremendously when there is metastasis. It appears that, that metastatic disease is the single most uh, powerful outcome predictor for uh, survival in uh, tumor with Ewing sarcoma family of tumors. Um, that we'll comment on is uh, pathological staging. And again, we have this plus simple, so it's like optional, and this is really optional uh, to comment on because all the criteria that's needed to do the pathological staging, we already have commented on, on the findings we went through. Of course, only applicable for resection. In the previous protocol in 2012, the pathological staging was mandatory using the AGCC state system, the seventh edition. There is an AGCC eighth edition, but the current protocol still, uh, that came just a few months ago, but the current protocol is still based on the seventh edition, as I mentioned. And the regular PT and staging system, if we want to take the labor and report on it, it we'll put it in a comment section. The AGCC staging has the descriptors, which include M for multiple, R for recurrent, Y for post-treatment. So most of uh, most of all, our Ewing sarcoma will have a Y simple preceding because they are post-treatment. And as I mentioned, the T stage will be the difference between T1 and T2 is more than a centimeter. The continuous tumors in bone site are regarded as T3. And then and in um, N0, they have, have this um, NX to say that we cannot uh, that we, we cannot assess lymph nodes because we don't have any. N0 and N1. Um, and for distant metastasis, they divided into 1A and 1B because patients with metastasis do poorly, but lung metastasis only, they tend to do slightly better than other sites. So currently for staging patients for metastasis, so the three main sites, the commonest will be the lung, so a CT, 
um, chest is used to assess this metastasis, bone scan for bone metastasis and bone biopsy for bone marrow um, metastasis. Um, tends to do uh, better, but overall, survival of patients with metastasis is very poor. For the staging, so we add the information we got from the primary tumor, from the PT stage, from the PA, from the lymph node uh, stage, and the distant metastasis, and the grade. And the grade of Ewing sarcoma is high grade. So sarcoma is undifferentiated, so it's the highest grade. So we grade four, and we add them in order to establish which um, is the stage of the tumor. This is completely optional. Uh, because all the information have been given in the um, uh, care, care protocol comments we have made earlier or findings we have reported earlier. This is one of the major differences between the 2012 and the current 2016 protocols. Uh, and this uh, is almost uh, the five few slides. So just as a reminder, so site of prognostic indicators of immune coma, so site is one of them, size is one of them. Soft tissue extension is one of them, but it's mainly assessed radiologically. Uh, prognostic factor, extent of disease, whether localized or metastasis, and site of metastasis, and response to chemotherapy. Any CAP protocol, additional findings we can report. For example, if we have a fracture, uh, we can report fractures in Ewing tend to be uncommon. And according to the children oncology group, they are not uh, taken as the poor prognostic indicator. They don't influence prognosis and their event. The last slide is um, an ac acknowledgement and thanks to the protocol website for allowing us to use uh, not only for patient services and reporting, but also for educational purposes. Uh, thanks to um, Ms. Shireen Williams and Ms. Ria Williams um, from a Canadian Partnership Against Cancer for tr their tremendous help, uh, particularly with the technical work uh, of the current presentation. Also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Joseph Denancy, um, uh, my colleague, for helping me to put this presentation together, and Dr. Jean McGowan from Children Hospital of Eastern Ontario for helping me with some of the images uh, that I used during the current talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. L. Dali, for that presentation. We are now going to move into the Q&A session of, um, of this presentation. So if anybody has any questions, if you can click on the chat tool on the top of your WebEx screen um, and type any questions you have, and then um, we will read them out. This is Dr. Joseph Donanasi. Finally, I am able to join the meeting. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning. So while we are waiting for questions to come in, um, I have a couple of questions, if I may. I missed the beginning of your presentation uh, because of the technical issues. So the question relating to the specimen mapping. Uh, do you map the bone and the soft tissue components together, like when you have a slice that has been decalcified, or when there is a significant soft tissue component, do you map the bone and the soft tissue component separately? Because, um, because we really need to identify the distance of the tumor from the soft tissue margin. It's really a point of preference, but I'll tell you what I do. I, I would map it with the bone. So uh, I would like to have the specimen, the bone slab, with attached soft tissue intact and map it entirely. And well, we need thank you. to assess the distance. We're well, waiting for more questions to come. If I may um, have an, uh, another one. Uh, 
uh, you showed a, a chart there, a, a diagram that showed that uh, even the uh, metastasis free five year survival is not 100%. I believe it was something like 60 or 70% uh, year survival for uh, metastasis free disease. So, why not 100%? What, what do patients with metastasis free disease die of? So the free, free for metastasis, as we have seen, the chemotherapy response. So, so when dealing with the tumor, the way I think about it, so we have metastatic tumor and we have a tumor adhesion, and we need to uh, achieve regional control. And to, okay, to do that, you. we need an effective chemotherapy. And as it has shown, like not all tumors will, will melt completely with the chemotherapy. Like some tumors, uh, some Ewing sarcoma that will be resistant to chemo uh, with yeah. well degree. And actually, the ones when we look at the uh, uh, Ewing sarcoma uh, assessment post chemo, when we have this cluster of tumor cells that are still viable, probably those are the ones that got resistant and will need more uh, uh, adjustment to the maintenance chemotherapy to respond to. Right. Another thing uh, that studies have shown that although by imaging we don't see metastasis in patients that look like only they are having uh, localized disease, when they applied RT-PCR studies on their peripheral blood and or the, on their bone marrow uh, biopsies, some of them showed the translocation present. This was thought to be or one of the prognostic indicators uh, of poor uh, of relatively poorer response compared to those uh, doesn't so even a patient who shows no evident metastasis when it doesn't mean entirely that there isn't small tumor cells circulating around. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. Anybody else uh, have have questions been coming in, Julia? There are no questions yet. Um, so if there's any questions, I encourage you to use the chat tool. Uh, a couple more minutes if anybody has any questions. Well, another one, if I may, while we are waiting, and um, Dr. Demelavi, you may or may not have the answer to this, but out of curiosity, I would ask, uh, you are showing those um, um, translocation um, uh, fusion genes, and I was wondering whether the partner gene does have any prognostic implications, you know, depending on what the partner gene is. Are there any prognostic connotations? So before, it was thought that um, the EWS fly fusion transcript type, so the um, site of, um, of exome um, um, uh, erasion do correlate with the prognosis. Uh, some studies have shown that, and they actually divided uh, into, um, w um, into type 1 and type 2. And um, in the previous protocol of 2012, um, um, some studies have shown that um, type 1 is a favorable prognosis compared to type 2. However, uh, recently, with larger studies, there is no, um, this doesn't act as a prognostic indicator and thus is not anymore included uh, under um, um, a prognostic indicator. Okay, so we have one question. Um, it's from Lauren Harvey, and she asks, can you talk a bit about the results of targeted therapy in Ewing? Um, example, uh, I met I did it. Oh, sorry, I can't pronounce this. I admitted it for the C kit positive tumor. So there is a subset of tumors that do uh, that are positive for uh, imatinib, um, and it's still under trial whether um, whether this targeted therapy will be helpful or not. Um, it be a question more for oncology rather than than for for pathology, um, but there is a number of uh, biologically uh, based approaches to treatment, and uh, particularly because for patients with metastatic disease, they they do poorly. So if we 
Africam uh, before chemotherapy have been applied to Ewing sarcoma, 10% of patients with Ewing sarcoma used to survive uh, five years. The rest all die. The use of the um, uh, of the chemo uh, of the chemotherapy protocols, this number have jumped to 75%. However, this is truly represent those with regional control. For the patient that doesn't show in metastasis on imaging or on pathology at time of presentation, those who have metastasis still have a very um, uh, grim outcome. And this is why there is a lot of uh, research going to use like things like inhibition of fusion codex, RNA helicase A, insulin-like growth factor, and type 1 receptors. Um, uh, small molecules, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, but all these are still, um, as far as I understand, are still ongoing uh, experimentally on research and not documented in uh, treatment. Okay, anybody else have any questions? We'll wait a couple more minutes, maybe five minutes or so, just if anybody else has any questions. While waiting for more questions to come in, um, I would like to make a a quick um, um, uh, introduction. Um, I am the designated host, uh, and uh, I wasn't able to join from the beginning, so I'm Dr. Joseph Donanasi. I am a pediatric pathologist and the former chief of the Division of Anatomical Pathology at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa, and I'm the chair of the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, the POGOS, and Genetics Diagnostic Cluster Task Force. The um, POGO Task Force was initiated in 2012 to provide recommendations to POGO's leadership and to the Government of Ontario um, regarding uh, pathology and genetic diagnostics practice in Ontario. So, um, I, again, I apologize for um, being late in uh, joining uh, uh, the, uh, the presentation the session as the designated host. Thank you, Julia, for taking over. And so can we see whether there are any questions? I'll, I'll just add one thing um, for the question by Dr. Lauren about um, emetinib. I just forgot to mention that um, a COG study, a phase two study for emetinib produced only part response among 24 uh, evaluated patients with the Ewing sarcoma family of tumor, and this has been reported in uh, uh, pediatric blood cancer in 2008. So it's still under trial and not integral part in the therapy of Ewing sarcoma. Okay. Further questions, Julia? Um, no, maybe another minute or so. If anyone has any final questions. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, we can move on to the closing remarks. Thank you, Julia. So in closing, uh, on behalf of the Pediatric Oncology Group of Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I'd like to thank Dr. Elde Melavi for an excellent presentation today. 
a reminder, both this live presentation and the recorded presentations are eligible for continuing um, um, uh, medical education credits. In order to request a certification of participation, please provide your name and email address at the link uh, included in the session notice. And here you will also find an optional session evaluation form, which we, of course, encourage you to complete. The information collected through the session evaluations then will allow us to ensure that the sessions continue to be informative and relevant uh, to your practice. So we very much appreciate your feedback and suggestions. And uh, please, uh, you can always see the session notice for more information uh, after this session. So in closing, I would like to remind everybody um, of the upcoming session next week. On March 29, 2017, we will have Dr. Jim Srigley uh, talking about uh, prostate, and so we are looking forward to that presentation. So with that, I would like to wrap up uh, this uh, session on Ewing sarcoma in pediatric patients. Thank you much for everybody uh, for attending, and um, um, I hope uh, you found this session informative. Thank you again.